Oh, hey, there are the Mac admins I'm looking for. Mac admins just waiting around for yes. a ride. Yes, on the side of the road. Yes. Mm -hmm. Completely, completely unplanned. Nonchalantly. Yeah. Yes. So you wanted to play yeah, some tunes? Just... You want me to tell Siri to play something? No, I think I'm okay. How about you? Uh, I would like to hear some music. I mean, we are at the Mac admins, so we have to do some Apple music, obviously. <sighs> like maybe something from a keynote? Huh? Yes. Yeah. Steve Jobs' last keynote. Okay. Uh, what, what or maybe you can play some um, Backstreet Boys. Uh, how about we skip that and just go straight to Ramstein? How, <laughs> uh, how about the Cuban Music Crisis? You guys know them? No. No, never heard them. <laughs> what about that song that has Parthenogenesis in it? I, I, I don't think I was born when that came out. So, mm. yeah. I don't think I was born. Guns N' Roses, Metallica. Mm. Yeah, classics. Pearl, Pearl Jam. They have that song that Jeremy. Oh, I don't like that song. Oh, you can clap, and I would like you to, because I want all the other rooms in the hallway to think that there's something really awesome going on. <laughs> because there isn't. All right. So, More fake yes, <laughs> we're uh, here in uh, Practical Python for Mac admins. Uh, so I'd like to talk with you about Python today. Uh, I believe in audience participation, and that's why I'm particularly disappointed about the way I've set up this session, because there just won't be any. No, just kidding. You can ask questions along the way, uh, but, and we'll have uh, a chance to ask questions at the end uh, if we get through everything. And uh, I have the catch box. Uh, and instead of throwing it, since I've been playing volleyball lately, I might try to set it. Uh, but I have to pass it around to everyone uh, who wants to ask questions, because we are uh, dealing with an overflow situation with people in another room watching. So thank you for your, uh, for your patience with that. Uh, you can see the uh, session and feedback links. Uh, since you just saw the video, this might be the best time to submit the feedback. It's probably not going to get any better. And if you happen to want to try Keynote Live, because I have no idea how it works, uh, that's the link for it. I do? OK. I did like to start the slideshow. All right, well then forget Keynote Live. <laughs> Apple. Uh, I'm Jeremy Reichman. I'm from Tamman Technologies. Uh, I live in southeastern Pennsylvania, near the city of Philadelphia and uh, the state of Delaware. Uh, and you can tell that I've been having a good day because I had breakfast at the Penn Stater. And I'd like to give special thanks to Nate Walk, with whom I presented a similar talk uh, in, I think, a smaller room uh, in 2013. Uh, certainly not two rooms. Uh, this talk is different, but it does share some of the same elements. Uh, that original talk had more of a focus on letting you read Python code if you were coming from the Bash shell. So if you are interested in um, being able to uh, move from Bash to Python, um, that's also a good talk to look at. And I want to give a little shout out to the Philadelphia area Mac admins. Uh, we have a, an active group uh, meeting monthly in the Philadelphia area, and one of the organizers is over there. Uh, so if you are interested in, that, interested in that, please check it out. And I'm very thankful that Penn State gathered us, gathers us together in such a fantastic conference every year. Uh, I've never realized until this year exactly how much PSU had the pulse of the future of Apple devices in mind. They've given out several items of hardware over the years that predicted where Apple was going with hardware. Of course, now we can charge our laptops with that hardware, with those power banks. And it's my belief that they have insight into the 2018 version of Mac OS, <laughs> High Sierra Elite. Today we'll be assuming that you're using Mac OS and that you're using the bundled system Python. If you have any other Python installed on your machine, uh, this is probably too advanced of a talk. Um, and you should know how to use the system Python uh, already if you ha are in that condition. So why would we use Python? It's a language. People use it to get work done. And you can use it on Mac OS. Uh, it's something that we can uh, count on uh, being on the machines, at least for the time being. With Apple, we never know the future. So 
maybe Penn State does. Uh, in terms of where Python sits, it's currently at number five on the Tyobi index for programming languages. So if you want to learn Python for no other reason that you have a career after the Mac uh, is no longer a thing, which might be 2019, um, then this could keep you uh, smart and employed and potentially lovable. Python is easy to learn. It's designed as a be beginner's language and its code is readable uh, in English. And the, one of the things I love and I'll talk about later is that I, you can lint the code and that just means that you can check that it's correct before you even run it. It's very powerful and the system Python ha has um, batteries included just like most, uh, almost all Python distributions, which means that it has a lot of modules that handle functions for you. And a lot of the practical talk I'll be doing today is using those modules. Uh, instead of doing things in bash with sed and awk and so on, or sometimes sed and awk, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, Python handles spaces really well um, in strings, which is something I always get frustrated with in bash. Uh, it also handles character entities in Unicode, which is uh, nice if you want to use um, characters beyond the ASCII character set. And it scales up uh, to different kinds of problems uh, and goes all the way down to small problems. It's also maintainable because you can read it so well, you, are, you can be your own maintenance programmer more easily in the future. Don't discount having to edit your scripts in the future, unless you're planning on the Mac going away in 2019. Uh, you may choose not to use Python, in which case you might be in the wrong set of two rooms, uh, but uh, it, it is different from the command prompt that you see, the bash command prompt uh, that we see by default in the terminal on Mac OS. And it's a different mindset uh, from Unix shell scripting because you're doing uh, different kinds of programming tasks. Uh, and you might not want to use it because you have to use a lot of shell utilities. Uh, the shell getting to shell utilities in Python takes a more code to do than it would take in Bash. You mi also might not want to use it because your organization doesn't want to. Uh, they may not want to take on another language uh, you know, and have to hire special unicorn people that, that uh, know Python. Um, and the other people on your team, if you have a team, might not want to use it. And it's, it is uh, still more complicated uh, in, in some respects than using Bash. We also have to deal with Swift. Swift, in a big picture, big picture perspective, is meant to scale from systems programming all the way up to, or all the way down to scripting. And it raises the question uh, on the Apple platforms of Python for Mac admins. After all, we cannot manage iOS, tvOS, and watchOS. If you need to stand, please do, um, at this time with Python. We also cannot manage those devices with Swift either, so uh, they're pretty equal in that respect. So I believe that Python does continue to have advantages today. If nothing else, uh, it does show in the Tyobi rankings that Python does have a wide reach, even beyond what Swift and Objective-C have. Um, I don't know if they track Bash or other Unix shells, though. Actually. But, uh, so Python is currently bundled with Mac OS and has been uh, since the beginning. There are py alternative Python installations, as I alluded to earlier, but they are not guaranteed to be on a device. So you may not have access to those capabilities if uh, you can't guarantee that, those, that, that, that the alternative Python is there. You can depend on the bundled one. Python on Mac OS is currently at version 2.7.10, uh, and the latest version of Python overall is Python 3.6.1, at least that last I checked, um, might have changed in the last week or so. Uh, and we just can't depend on, on uh, Python 3 at this point. When I gave the talk in 2013, uh, I, w I said that Python 3 was dead to me because it, it was not available at, built into Mac OS, and so I, I couldn't depend upon it. And it's kind of strange that so many years later that, the, that that's still the case. Um, hopefully at some point, Apple will pay attention to those scripting languages and, and uh, update them to their latest versions, including Python. We can use it anywhere 
that we want to do some scripting for that manages the system or user environments. Uh, we can also include Python scripts in packages if you use the, uh, the convenient bundle of scripts uh, idea for creating packages. Uh, you cannot use them within the uh, Mac OS installer upgrade environment, uh, although that seems to be going away as a way to, to add in packages, uh, with things like create OS 10 package. And you can also use it with management systems. Uh, Monkey, Jamf Pro, uh, most management systems beyond those as well also have uh, the ability to run other commands that have what we call shebang lines. Uh, and our executable code. Um, sorry, I skipped that. Uh, so there's lots of web applications and desktop tools that are available um, in th that have Python support. Those are just a few of them. And I think Python can be a win uh, anywhere where scripts are longer than a couple of lines. I tend to draw my personal uh, line at around five lines of code. Uh, if I can do a bash script uh, in less than that, uh, and I'm not dealing with a lot of the other things like text, then I will often, um, I will often just deal with bash at, at with a short script. Um, I often tend to regret it when I go to bash for a longer script, uh, so that that's my personal preference. Uh, and Python can also be a win when you need to process or evaluate text, including unit code text complex data structures like JSON. Uh, if anybody's looking uh, to use things like the JAMP API, uh, Python can help with that. And there's actually a session at this conference about that kind of thing, um, but you missed it. Uh, it was this morning. Uh, sorry about that order. Um, you can also deal with numbers and version numbers and dates uh, natively within Python and do things like calculate with them or compare them uh, to be greater than less than, which is really handy. Uh, doing the same kind of thing uh, by comparing strings in Bash uh, ends up with some, some uh, cumbersome solutions. And Python also lets you call in system frameworks. Uh, so you're actually calling some of the code that Apple puts there, um, and it's the same thing that other applications would be using. So let's get started with Python. In the terminal, if you want to follow along, um, and you happen to have downloaded the GitHub repo, um, it doesn't matter. Um, it just gives you some sample code, uh, sample uh, sample files at this point. I, I will put more code into that GitHub repo. Uh, the, uh, the the sample um, the sample scripts that you're seeing here uh, will go into that GitHub repo. But you do have the files um, that I'll be working with. Um, they're data files like uh, um, CSVs and other things like that. So once you go into a directory and then type the Python command, the Python interpreter starts up. And you get some version information. The Python interpreter is interactive, somewhat like the bash shell. Um, it does start in whatever directory you are currently in in that terminal session. And it inhel inherits your shell environment, and possibly some other environment variables if you choose. Uh, it has a command prompt that looks like greater than signs. And if you want to find out where the Python interpreter thinks it is in your file system, you can uh, start off by importing the OS module. This is the first part of batteries included. So Python puts a lot of functionality in modules. There's a core set of functionality in the main language, um, but modules contain um, sometimes very critical functions. In this case, we're going to use the method OS get CWD or uh, uh, get current working directory. And I don't show you some output here because this will be different if you're trying this on your own. Does anybody want to see that text for a little bit longer? I saw a line or a hand. We were are going to have some much longer um, uh, snippets of code, things that you both won't be able to type in uh, while we're going through. Um, I, I think this is going to be a good session to have the slides for and that uh, GitHub repo later uh, to try those things out. Moving on, Python famously uses indenting or white space to separate code blocks. So the white space 
indicates where a code block starts and stops. A big important issue is that you must keep be consistent with the white space that you put into your scripts when you're when you're writing script files. Um, and if you're writing scripts already in any other language, you're probably doing that. So this isn't that much of a change. So tabs versus spaces is always a big issue. And I just loved this article a, a little while ago that the developers who use spaces uh, make more money than those who use tabs. And my response was a, a kind of a flippant one about Apple putting tabs in every app after supporting spaces for many years before that. I know it's a bad joke. Uh, so scripts are text files that either have or don't have the Python, the, the .py py extension. Uh, you don't have to put the extension on them, just like you don't need to put the .sh on the end of your shell script files if you're doing shell scripting. Uh, it just matters that they have the right shebang line and they're executable. That will get them to launch in Python. To get a script to launch in Python, you have to use the, uh, a shebang line like the first one. This will give you the Mac OS system Python. I'm going to try this. Right there. Amazing, this technology. Um, and if, you, if you're looking on the internet, you'll often see advice for calling Python with user bin env Python. Uh, that will work with the system Python on Mac OS, but I keep wanting to say Mac OS 10 now, now that they've changed the name back. So, um, every time I was doing that in practice. Uh, that, that command, or that uh, shebang line, will call p the system Python, but if you or your users have installed any other versions of Python on the system, and those versions of Python are ahead of the system Python in the, the path environment variable, then that Python will run instead. So in order to c keep control of what you're running for your users on their managed devices, use the first form, user bin Python. You may also see references to using other versions of Python like this, uh, using that user bin env construction. Um, that does exist. Again, we don't have Python 3 on Mac OS as a built-in feature right now, so we can't, we can't do that, but you will see these. Those are valid. We just don't use them for the system Python. There is a uh, Python enhancement proposal. Uh, they have hundreds of these now, uh, but one of the first ones, PEP8, uh, defines some of the code style that you uh, might want to use for your scripts. So they suggest using four spaces per indentation level because those code blocks in their indentation, uh, you can have something nested within something nested, something within something nested. Uh, so that's, um, they, they recommend using four spaces each time you have to nest. Uh, and they also recommend using words with underscores like the first example, this underbar is underbar the underbar style. And also they uh, suggest that you wrap lo long lines within parentheses. In this presentation, I will be using backslash to break a line. Um, so if you see that, that means that the line continues on to the next one. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier for copying and pasting. Um, but uh, but the, uh, Python, uh, the official Python style guide for the Python project would recommend using parentheses. It's not something I do myself, so I break that one all the time. Encoding is something we need to consider if we're using Unicode text or anything beyond ASCII. If you're using the, those kinds of characters in your scripts or your text editor is saving p uh, Python files um, as UTF-8 text, then you probably want to put in these two lines. These help the Python interpreter know that there's uh, potentially Unicode information in your scripts. Um, this is not necessarily most of the time, but I just want you to be aware of it so that you don't run into some potential problems later. Linting is something that I love uh, because I make a lot of errors and I like to find them before I run my scripts. So I happen to use bbedit, and I have integrated the last of these tools, Flake 8, uh, with a script that I found on, I think, Stack Overflow. I mean, where does anybody find anything anymore? Uh, and I 
can call this, uh, this linting tool, Flake 8, uh, while I'm developing a script, and it will tell me where the errors are so I can fix them. And oftentimes, the first time I run the script, it runs successfully. And when I started to realize that that was the case, I, I was just addicted because I like things to run successfully. Um, I think the technical uh, setup for these is that PEP8 and PyFlakes are all run by Flake8. These are all additional items that you would have to install, um, and th uh, they get added into the list of modules that you have in Python. Variables in Python are similar to variables in, ever, in any, uh, any other language. Uh, they're names of arbitrary length, so they can just be strings of text, uh, and they can include letters, numbers, and symbols. They have to begin with a, a letter. That's one important thing. And there's a few uh, names that are reserved that you can't use, things like for, uh, because they're used by the language. But as for values, they can be any other kind of object, including true-false values, numbers, and things made of other things. These come into play as the Python data types of Booleans, uh, numbers or numeric items, sequences, and mappings. So the, to, uh, to get a type of an item, uh, you can use the type function, uh, and you just put the name of that object inside the parentheses. So you can do this, uh, like you, do, you could do that with the OS uh, module that we used earlier. You could see that. I should tell you that it's a module. That's one I haven't tried recently, so I'll try not to make more things up along the way. Um, if you need help on some of the, on the data types, you can also use the help uh, function. This is similar to getting the man page for the item that you're, you're uh, specifying. Booleans give you true t false values. The true value is true. False actually has two values. You can use false or none. Numeric values consist, consist of integers and floats, uh, which would be floating point values and decimals. Uh, and the important thing to note about numbers, the number types, is that they are not quoted. So if you're used to quoting things in shell scripting, um, numbers in Python don't have quotes around them. That's how Python knows their numbers. So assigning a variable to a number would look like this. In this case, the variable number 1 is 717. And number three is a negative number, 1024. Sequences include lists, strings, and tuples. Strings are what you would expect. They're text, they're alphanumeric, punctuation, white space, and character codes. They're always quoted. You can use single or double quotes, and unlike in shell scripting, they're interchangeable. You can also use triple quotes to have strings that include line feeds. So those are handy if you want to have, you know, like a long paragraph that, that you wrap ahead of time. Uh, and you can find out more about the string type by doing help str. So that's a command you could type in uh, right in terminal if you want to see the output. The first two string examples here are, are hello world uh, in single and double quotes. They're interchangeable. They result in the same thing. That third line shows you how to determine, how to evaluate whether the two items are the same, and that should evaluate to true if you if you type the first three in. The third string is one of those longer strings, and it's triple quoted. In this case, with single quotes, you know, all these triples and doubles and singles is kind of crazy to explain, uh, but uh, that that gives you the ability to have that text wrap. And the last string at the bottom is 1024 by 768 in Unicode. That character code is a mathematical uh, multiplication sign. So it's more like typesetting uh, a display resolution. That display resolution was much more common in 2013 than it is in 2017. String formatting is a method for inserting variable data 
into a longer string. Uh, and this can make your variables smaller because you don't have to have a big, long, you know, complex set of text um, for every, uh, every situation. You can use smaller variables and insert them into longer strings along the way. Um, in this case, substitute this would be going into the, the spot where the zero is in the curly braces, and substitute that would be going into the, the spot where num uh, the number one is in curly braces. Uh, and this is because Python is zero referenced, so it starts counting things at zero. Uh, so the first item in the formatting list there is substitute this. That's I what we call index zero. The other examples at the bottom are a little bit less common, but you will see those in code, uh, and that's uh, another way to substitute in some text. The percent %s is a string, and the percent %d is, di is for digits. So it would expect to be inserting numbers. Lists in Python are arrays. Al they're also known as arrays. And they're sequences of other objects. In lists, the order is very important. It's the most important thing, in fact. Uh, lists can contain any other data type. And you create them by uh, using square brackets. Uh, square brackets by themselves creates an empty list which you may need to do to initialize a list. And you can find out more about those with the help command. And you can specify them either way by using list or s empty square brackets. Tuples act like a list. The big difference is that they can't be changed. So you can't add or remove items from a tuple. And I put them here uh, because some of the output of some commands will use them. And you'll, you'll see them in a lot of Python code. One of the interesting things is that even though you mo usually see them with parentheses, uh, I don't think they technically require parentheses. So. so you may see items with commas in between them, but no parentheses around them, and they're actually a tuple. Dictionaries are key value pairs. You're mapping that key to a value. Order is not important. When you're referring to the items in a dictionary later, you're referring to them by name. And you use curly braces to create a dictionary. And again, the help command for that. Dictionary keys are case sensitive. Uh, I, know I should throw in an APFS joke here. Um, there are no duplicates within the keys for a dictionary. So you, you can only have one key with one uh, string of characters. Uh, and if you add a, a new value in for an existing key, uh, that new value overwrites the previous value. Dictionary values can be any other data type, uh, and you can, you can mix and match them, uh, and you can nest them, and they're very similar if, uh, to the structure of what we see in a property list on macOS. Booleans, now that we've gone through the other types, are, can be extended so that any item, any integer, float, string, list, dictionary, that has contents in it evaluates to true, uh, which is useful in if statements. So if you know that you're, if you if you need to evaluate whether something is true or false, you can just say if, and then give a list, for example. And if that list has uh, something in it, it will return true. If it if it's an empty list, it will return false. And you know the uh, the if and the else will be called based on that. So empty things are always false. So let's, uh, let's go on a little bit. Most of the practical Python uh, that I've accomplished has come thanks to Stack Overflow, uh, the, uh, uh, the official Python documentation, um, which comes up in Google searching a lot, and some intrepid websites that post uh, Python examples. For the rest of the session, I'd like to go through and collect some of those useful tidbits uh, so I'm going to have a lot of code on the screen, and it's very quiet in these two rooms, so, but you're all attentive, so that's good. I haven't seen anybody fall asleep yet. Uh, but think of this as kind of a big dump of useful things from uh, Stack Overflow. We're going to be looking at system information. We're going to work with using paths in Python, finding out more about files, working with those files and getting data out of them, 
and finally comparing that data so we can do something useful with it. So I think these are the kinds of functions that we all need to do as Mac admins. We may not need to do it in the, in the brave future of iOS admins, but let's do what we can while we can. So we're going to start off with system information. And right in the shell prompt, uh, and I know you're in probably in the Python interpreter and Slack, uh, you can go back into the terminal and get a new tab to go into the shell, and you can do which-a Python. When you do that, it'll show you all the versions of Python that are in your path. So if you have multiple versions of Python, that they will probably show up here. Uh, and hopefully you see, if you, if, you, if you haven't used Python before, hopefully you only see user bin Python. We can then run the Python command by itself with dash dash version, and that prints out the version string of the, of the Python uh, interpreter. To find out that same kind of information inside Python, back in the interpreter, you can import the sys module. And once you've done that, you can use the print command to print the version object in that sys module. Or the, uh, yeah, sys module. Uh, and it'll print out this kind of information. Sometimes I'll be using the print command, sometimes I won't uh, throughout this. You might want to notice that um, and see the difference between whether the things I print out um, versus just call are quoted or not. It might be, it might be a Mac Pro uh, for somebody if they can figure that one out. Uh. <laughs> um, in the, uh, the last example, we can import the Objective-C uh, binding module, PI Objective-C, and I've actually jammed two commands onto this line just to show you that it can be done. Normally in Python, um, uh, Pythonic code, as they like to say, uh, you would want to have each command on its own line. You'd want to have shorter, uh, less complex lines. Uh, that's just for you as a maintenance programmer in the future, and you know a lot of Python programmers follow that maxim. So in this case, I, I have the two commands together. I'm importing the module, and then I'm getting the version from it. Um, sometimes you will see these double underbar uh, objects uh, referenced when you take your many daily trips to Stack Overflow. Maybe I'm the only one that does that. I don't know. Uh, and uh, on, honestly, I've never really dealt with what the double underbars mean. So I know you probably want to ask me, but I won't have a good answer. There are probably people at the conference that will. So 2.51 is the version uh, of, object of the Pi Objective-C binding. If we want to get more system data, this is also something you can do uh, right on your system. You can import the platform module. This is another one of the batteries included modules. Uh, the macOS version info variable is something that I'm setting to the output of the platform macver method. And then I just type Mac the macOS version info variable again and press return, and it prints out this tuple. And so we, uh, with that, I can find where the 10.12.5 string is in that, uh, in that variable, and I'm finding that it's an index zero. Again, Python is zero indexed, and so that item is, at the, is the zeroth item in the list. There's three items, that they're labeled zero, one, two. I, I can reference that with, by using square brackets again uh, in a slightly different context. So uh, I put the zero inside the square brackets, and it prints out just the text uh, from that zeroth item. Do the same thing for the second, or the number two item, number, the index two item, and it shows me the last item in the list. Another way to refer to the last item in a Python list is by using negative one, going backwards through the list. And now I can turn that tuple, which can't be modified, into a list so that I can modify it. To do that, I'm going to import the subprocess module because I want to have something to add to the list. So I'm going to add the build number into the list. I'm going to set macOS build equal to the output of the swvrg command, which you uh, hopefully have seen before. And I'm just getting the build version for that. And then the last bit of text there is a s the strip method, which is one of the very many text methods that's available in Python that lets you do um, all sorts of text manipulation uh, to, to uh, the text you're working with. 
And that strip method is stripping the white space from the beginning and the end of the string. It's a very handy thing. Um, if you're used to doing this kind of thing in Bash, you're probably having to use sed or awk for that uh, to strip off things that you don't want. Python can do a lot of this for you uh, with its string methods. Now I'm appending the macOS build variable to that list. And when I print out the, the contents of that list, I now have a fourth item at index three. And it's the build of the computer, the build of the OS on the computer. I don't like that, that uh, middle item. It just looked ugly. There's a lot of parentheses and commas. So I'm going to delete that. So I use the del function. And I'm going to delete index one where that item existed. And I'm going to print out the list. And you can see that those parentheses and commas disappeared. Now there's three items in the list again. And then finally, I'm going to get the, just the macOS version item in the zeroth position, the one that we saw a couple slides ago. And I'm going to have that set in a variable all by itself, because I probably need to use that again. Now, user data. W hopefully, we have users, because otherwise, why do they have computing devices to manage? So we're going to import the foundation library from Apple. And we're going to import uh, just the NS username function. And, that, and I'm going to use the NS username function. It's going to print out Jeremy. That text uh, has a U in front of it. That indicates that that's Unicode text, like the 1024 by 768 example that I had a couple of slides ago. Output of text that you get from Apple's system libraries is going to be Unicode. So the ability to handle Unicode is very handy. Most of the time, we don't have to worry because we're not dealing with a lot of special characters, uh, at least in English. But uh, your, your needs may vary. And now this is going to be a little bit long to type in, so you might wa not want to do this one uh, right now. But uh, we're going to import uh, two more functions from uh, the foundation library from Apple. And I'm going to create a user data dictionary using the curly braces. And I'm going to set three strings as keys, username, home directory, and full username. And I'm going to use a colon to map those keys to the values. And the values are going to be the outputs of those functions, ns username, ns home directory, and ns full username. Once I do that and I print the output, I get that dictionary in curly braces with those names mapped to the values. Hold on, hold on. I have to pass this to you. Let me try this. It works. Is it, is it flipped there? Because the home directory full username is listed one way, and then at the bottom it's listed the other way. Is that just an error in the slide? or uh, In terms of the order? Yeah. Order does not matter at all in dictionaries. So the way that you input the dictionary it can be completely different from the way that Python will display it to you later. And that's a very good question. Um, the, um, the way that Python will do it is really so it can manage its own storage. So it's doing whatever's going to perform best for it. Um, if you need to refer to them later, you'll be referring to them by the name of the key. So we're I will have some other user data that I might want to collect. And this begins one of the most commonly used and copy copied snippets of Python code. It's found in a lot of scripts, including shell scripts that you'll see. Uh, and people use this to find the console user. And this user data is a lot of code. Again, you're probably not going to want to type this. But the output, in my case, was Jeremy, because I was logged into the computer. Uh, and it's really nice to just know this in case you need it. You don't need it in lots of scripts. But again, I'm collecting things as if I'm presenting Stack Overflow to you. Uh, the information on, on the SC dynamic store copy console user um, function is in that technical Q&A from Apple that's referenced on the slide. But again, nice to know if a user is logged in and who that user is. And you can do that, I believe, as root, too, which is important to be able to do. So environment data, I just want to get another dictionary in front of you. Uh, so I'm going to import OS, because I haven't imported it enough yet. And I'm going to print os.environ. Uh, and this shows all the environment variables 
that are available to my Python session right, and Python interpreter. Um, sometimes you may need to add to those environment variables. You can, do, you can do that. You don't just have to read from any of these things. A lot of times I'm going to be showing you something that you're reading, but you can often, if not always, write back to the same structures. And just to show you what I can do uh, to take action on things within a, a dictionary, I'm going to set up a for loop. So I'm going to do for, and the k and the v are really just uh, a tuple. So they're just variables that I'm creating along the way. So they look a little magical, but they're not. They're just variables that I'm setting up. And they're going to get the contents of the items in the OS environ dictionary. So that's what items is giving me. The items method is giving me all the items that I saw on the last slide. And then you end a for loop, the, the first line of a for loop with a colon. And then you indent because this is a code block that needs some white space. And I'm putting in the print, func uh, print function and using k comma v. And that will start printing out the environment variables, their names, comma, value. And they'll be tuples, so they'll just have parentheses around them. And I just trimmed this off so you don't see all of the environment variables. But that's a simple for loop. You can take actions on, on things in a dictionary. Uh, using a for loop, you just change what's in that print from change from that print statement to something else. Now let's move on to m paths, and one of the first things we can do is build a path. Again, we'll import OS. This module is probably going to be used in lots of your scripts if you're writing any Python, especially if you're doing anything on disk. I'm going to set the variable selected disk to be the root of the disk as a string. And then I'm going to create a variable, svpath, and I'm going to use ospathjoin, which is one of the batteries included uh, methods inside the OS module. I'm going to add the selected disk with all these other strings. And the result will be what I see at the bottom of the screen. And notice in the join method, you don't see all the other slashes. The join method puts them in, and it does so in a cross-platform way. So it knows on Mac OS that the, the path separators are slashes. And if we were doing this on Windows, it would show something different. We can manipulate paths just the way we can in the shell uh, with uh, some similar commands. The base name method is available. That gives us just the name of the file in that entire path. So it just splits off that one part. The dir name gives us all the stuff that preceded it. And one that I love is split ext. And that splits the extension off of the rest of the string. It could be an entire path you're giving it, or it could just be um, the file name itself. Either way, you get the extension as a second item in a tuple. Uh, and I find that really useful, rather than having to figure out where the period is and trying to you know, manipulate things that way. Um, they've already thought of this, they've done it the right way so that you get it, especially in a cross-platform uh, environment. Oftentimes I want to find files, and one of the, the most frequent ways I find files in Python is with shell globbing, strangely enough. And so there's a module for that that's built in called glob, so I'm going to import that. It's one of my favorite module names. Uh, and I'm going to set, you can see this variable is old now. Uh, it's OS 10 install, and I'm going to use the glob method in the glob um, uh, module. I just love that it's glob glob. Some days I walk around saying that. And uh, I'm putting in a string, and the backslash lets me continue on to the next line, and that string has asterisks in it that are just th the same thing as using asterisks to do shell globbing in bash. And this prints out a list of all the different Mac OS installer apps in the Applications folder. I didn't actually have all of them installed, so I did fudge that one a little, but I thought you'd like seeing them all. And this is not necessarily the order they would have printed out in, uh, because I was fudging. I put them in the right order in reverse chrono uh, chronology. Uh, so we can also do a find, find files by searching, and for that, you can use the os walk uh, method. 
uh, I find OS Walk complicated, and I always have to read about it every time that I use it. And then I realize that I don't use it very often, and I'm hoping that you don't either. Um, I don't want you to get, to get anxious about using it. It is very handy, and I do use it from time to time. But it's just not, not the most frequent thing, so I'm not going to put a whole lot of, uh, put any explanation behind it. But if you happen to already like using the find command, or even sometimes the MD find command, you could also use those tools with the subprocess module and call those and get the results from, from those shell utilities. These options exist if you want. URLs, though, I do have to deal with from time to time. Uh, and one of the things that I think is interesting is that Python understands URLs. Uh, it has modules to deal with things like that. It can download from URLs, uh, but because of SSL and some of the things that have been happening over the last couple of years as we've been moving on to uh, uh, SHA-256 certs and things like that, the system Python has not really kept up with handling SSL. So using SSL, you really might want to um, uh, use the subprocess command and call curl. Uh, I'm not going to do that in this case. I'm going to take the path less traveled and just parse the URL. So I'm going to take this, this URL for a software update feed, something that you might use in auto package. And this software update feed happens to be a plist uh, that comes from the vendor. So I'm going to take that software update feed and I'm going to split the URL into components using the URL parse modules, URL, URL parse, yeah, URL split method. And the result is this split result. And you can see that it breaks it down into the formal components of a URL. And it can be very useful to have that. Now, you, you'll notice that the path uh, looks a lot like a shell path, of course. Uh, you can also um, use things like split ext on that. So if you needed to get the extension of a file that you downloaded uh, from a URL, you can also split the extension and find that out. Uh, so those are, those are uh, nice capabilities to have. If we want to get more information about files, we can start off by finding whether they exist. That svpath file exists because it should be on every OS 10 system, or yeah, Mac OS system. And isdir is another method that lets us find out whether the, uh, that particular path is a directory. And that, in this case, it's false because that was a file. The isLink method will let us tell whether the uh, path that we give, in this case I'm putting it right into the, in between the parentheses for the, for the method call, uh, and we're finding out if it's a symlink. And slash temp on macOS is a symlink, so this returns true. I can do the same thing for slash private slash temp, and it returns false because it's a directory. I'm going to do some, some stuff with dates now. Yes? Thank you. What specifically are we checking to see? Uh, oh, JK, we're still doing sorry. is I link. Just, yep, read that wrong. Thank you. That's all right. Yep. I got it. I saved your laptop. <laughs> I was going to draw on that slide, and I was all ready. Oh, well. All right, so I'm going to do some date math, and date math makes me thirsty, so I'm going to get a drink. Uh, the, the way I do a lot of this is by using date time, the date time module. Um, Python has a lot of functions built in for handling uh, some very, very interesting data types, and dates and times are one of those. So I'm going to use the date time module, and I'm going to uh, look at the apple setup done file. Uh, Anybody remember what this file does? Yep. Yeah, everybody familiar with it? Yeah, all right, good. Uh, so I'm going to use the date time module, and I'm going to, fir well, first really what's happening is I'm going inside out. I'm getting the, the M time of ASD path. That's the beginning. And once I get the M time, yeah, sorry. Uh, once I get the M time of ASD path, then I'm going out and getting the timestamp version of that. And finally, at the end, 
I am converting that into a date format. And, da and the percent %c date format is just a standard shorthand for the particular date format you see below uh, with the, the uh, day name and the date and the time. So that's pretty handy. So I did that with the m time. So I want to find out the c time as well because that's a little bit different and there's a, func and there's a method for it. And you can see that the date, uh, the date and time for the c time on that file is different. And if you hold those in your, in your head, Yeah. Uh, well, so C time is the last time the file's inode was changed. That means that permissions might have been changed, the file might have been renamed, some things like that. M time is the last time the file's contents were changed. And this one, A time, is the last time the file was accessed. So does anybody want to take a guess at what I did between these two commands? Reboot it. Hmm? Reboot it. I did not reboot. No, I actually, it's much simpler than that. No, I mean, you first time in. You ran, you ran the Python script, which... No, nope, no. nope. So it doesn't modify... I, I just did less or cat or something like that. I read the file. Okay. So I accessed it. Do the that was, I guess, too tricky. Do the earlier Python commands against, the, against that file change its access time? Thank you. Thank you. For Do that. the um, earlier Python commands uh, against that that file change when it was accessed? Because it looks like they should. Uh, well, they didn't because I ran these commands sequentially on in, on, on my device, uh, and you can see that the file was last accessed. Uh, sorry, manage software update wants to run. Um, <laughs> I thought I I thought I stopped that. Um, so uh, so. Uh, you know, I'd run the other commands before I got the A time in both cases. So it was uh, 2015 uh, when I first started. So now uh, we can find some more information, and, and these are kind of complicated looking. So uh, I, uh, I'm putting here them here mostly for reference. I don't actually do a lot of this in Python, but you might need to, depending on what your needs are. So this is how you get the, the uh, mode for the file. We're using three different uh, modules, OS, STAT, and PWD uh, for these examples. And this gives me the output of the numeric, uh, the numeric mode of 0755 for private Etsy. And for the same thing on slash temp, since we've been using that path, uh, it gives me 01777. And I did slash private slash temp just for good measure because we've got a symlink and a directory, and it gave me the same thing. Yes. I'm terrible about remembering the catch box. So um, the syntax that you're using there where you're kind of chaining the methods together, is that the equivalent of piping stuff in Bash, or does it, compo like, does it compose into one call? Uh, uh, yes and yes, is the way I think of it. Um, I'm, I'm, I am doing something similar to pipe in the sense that I'm taking the output of one function or method and essentially passing it on to the next one. Uh, and it's it's all a matter of you know what's inside parentheses and what's you know and and the and then there's also the periods that you separate. So once you have an object, you're usually running methods with a period after them, um, and that's I think to me more like piping. Um, whereas when the um, the methods or functions are with within the parentheses, I feel that's more like just one big call. But okay, thank you. But uh, technically, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, and sometimes when I can't get things to work, I just muddle through it and check Stack Overflow again. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to show you these things so you don't have to go to Stack Overflow, um, even though it's such a wonderful site. Um, now I'm going to get the, the UID of uh, the owner of the file, and I'm going to use the sample CSV file that's on that, uh, in that GitHub repo, uh, and that... CSV's UID should be uh, co should correspond to your UID on your system, which might be 501. Uh, and since that's a number, I want to convert that into the name, and that's what the PW name method does for me. Uh, it gets me 
the name for a particular UID. And you can imagine that that might be useful in more cases than just getting the owner of a file. Um, you should be able to convert the UID of any account to a name using that function, using that method, rather. And one other thing that I love doing is hashing files to determine whether they've changed or not. Uh, this happens a lot in places like Monkey. If you're using an installs array that might include a hash of files to determine uh, whether something needs to be installed or not. Uh, and the hashlib module is built in, and it supports SHA-256 hashes. So I'm going to get that, that SHA-256 hash of sample.csv. And I do that by opening, sorry, I did the wrong click. I'm going to do that by opening the sample CSV file and then reading it. This is, again, the nesting that we talked about. Uh, and then I'm going to get the hash of that item. And finally, I'm going to get the hex digest of that hash. So that's more or less the way things go in this case. It's kind of complex, but again, it's kind of boilerplate code. All you have to give it is the, is the uh, path name. You can do the equivalent thing in shell by using the SHA sum command. Uh, but if you want to stay in pure Python because you're already there, uh, then this is one way to do that. If you want to find an executable, like using which on the command line, you can use the distutils module. It has a find executable function. And in this case, I tried to find rsync. And, I, and you can see that rsync, uh, I have a version installed in my user local folder, because uh, I love compiling rsync all by myself. Uh, and so that rsync is, uh, you know, overrides the one that's in um, the user bin folder. So you can use this in your scripts to find the path to a particular executable that you might need to use. So we also may want to work with the data in files. And Python encourages a, um, a method of doing this. It's called easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And they give it an acronym. Um, Python documentation is kind of cute that way. Uh, and they also have uh, another scheme that they talk about called look before you leap. But they want you to do, e uh, it's easier to ask for permission um, and what they're trying to do is encourage you to just do something, and if it fails, Python will throw an exception. Um, and you'll see this if you get into doing any Python at all. I get a lot of exceptions, um, sometimes even when I lint my code. Uh, so uh, if an exception gets thrown, you can catch that exception and do something when it happens. So it's basically like um, using the double pipes in shell, where you do something else when you're command fails. Uh, so th this can be really handy. Um, and I just mentioned this because I came across it while I was doing my talk again, and, and I thought it was an interesting thing to bring up. So this, this does kind of embody that scheme. I'm going to work with a CSV file, th that CSV file that I've been talking about. And I'm going to open that file using the open function and set the results of that to this variable. And then I'm going to start a block of code with try. My blocks of code start without being indented, and they have a colon in them. And then I start indenting after the colon on the next line. So I'm going to set up a reader object, a CVS reader object. And this is coming from the CS CSV module. And it's going to look kind of complex. But it, it, I, think that I think this ability to deal with CSVs is just so fantastic that I'll deal with the complexity. Uh, so I'm going to read that CSV file that I just found. And I'm going to do it in the dialect of Excel because the CSV module knows different kinds of CSV files. I think it can even do tab delimited files, which means it's kind of not named correctly. Um, and then I'm going to go through that CSV file that I'm reading, and I'm going to go through it row by row in my for loop. And I'm going to print out the first column of each row. And the first column is the zeroth index of the row. So that row is a variable. I'm getting index 0 of row. And I'm using that strip method again to take all the white space off the beginning and the end. And when I do that, well, first, I need to finish my try block. I'm going to do that by using finally. So at the end, when all of everything is done in that try block and there hasn't been an exception, like there's no been, been no errors, um, I, get, I call finally and I close the file so that it's no longer sitting open with a file descriptor. And then 
my code will run, and I'll get the first column of that CSV file. And the CSV file in the GitHub repo is one that I created just for this, and I dumped it out of Excel, Excel 2011. Uh, so it, it, it definitely uses the Excel dialect, because everybody should speak in Excel. <laughs> now, this is another one that you're not going to want to type in, but it's, uh, we're looking at a property list file. And with property lists, uh, you can use the foundation uh, library again. And I just want to point out some of the, the some of the things along the way. Getting a path to the xprotect meta plist file, and then I'm using the foundation library to read it. And again, this is more complicated um, stuff. I use I just consider this boilerplate co code and change things um, basically where the orange text is when I need to. Uh, and then once, uh, once I've read that, I'm getting the, you know, the data out of the file. And then once I have the data out of the plist, I am reading it as if it's a, di a dictionary. So when I'm reading a dictionary and pulling things out, because that's what a plist is, a plist is a big dictionary, uh, I'm pulling them, the items out by name. So it kind of goes back to your question. So a plugin blacklist is one of the names of the, the keys in the plist. So I'm getting that. And then underneath plugin blacklist, there must be another dictionary because I'm getting the key 10. And then after that, I'm getting the key uh, inside you know, a dictionary under 10 that's uh, for the Flash player. And then finally, I'm getting the key under that dictionary. Uh, this is all one line of code uh, with no slash backslashes. Uh, and the, uh, I'm getting the minimum plugin version minimum plugin bundle version. And then I print that out. And after all of that code, I get a version of Flash Player. And that's the minimum, of course, that we can use on the system if we choose to use Flash. Unfortunately, that has not changed since I first gave this talk. Um, although I guess we have fewer instances of Flash nowadays. Uh, one of the other things you might have to deal with as a Mac sysadmin is um, reading files uh, that are config files or INI files. There are a number of these files you, you get typically with agents from various vendors, like security vendors and people that, uh, uh, vendors that don't deal as much with um, uh, the underpinnings of the Mac. They want to do their own thing, or they want to do something cross-platform. So luckily, Python has a module to read these config files. It's called config parser. So I'm going to read a particular file, and it's this is in the sample data in the GitHub repo sample config header.ini. And I'm going to set up a config parser um, object for that. And I'm going to read that module at the file path. Again, you might not want to type this one in. It might be something you want to look at later. And then I'm going to set up a for loop. I'm going to go through all the item names uh, in the list that's right here after the in text. So I'm going to be looking for version and server name. However uh, many other names are in that config file, I'm only looking for those two. And I'm going to set that item name equal to uh, the response I get from getting that, that um, information out of the, con uh, the config file. I'm going to look under the main heading in the config file. If you uh, happen to look at that Git re GitHub repo, uh, it has a heading called main. And I'm going to look for version and then server name and print out those values. In this case, I end up with 5.3 and mustang.example.com. And this is, I always have a problem with the scrolling on this, so let me see if I can get this to come back. So this is a, an item I got right off of uh, uh, Stack Overflow. And it helps with the kinds of config or INI files that don't have any headers in them, uh, which as you might imagine, some vendors do, Oracle. Uh, and so Java properties files uh, are just like INI files, but they have no headings in them. Python, with its config parser module, has a problem with this. It expects headings. Uh, so this class is just, again, boilerplate text that I put into scripts when I need to use it. Uh, and it's been really handy for that. Really what it does is it's letting me add Gonna, oop, I keep pressing the wrong button. Uh, it lets me add a heading called a section 
into the data that I already read out of the config file. So that's all this is doing. And I'm going to go to the next page. And I'm going to read that, uh, read the no header.ini file that's in the GitHub repo. I'm going to set up that same kind of config parser uh, object. I'm going to read the config file. I'm going to do the same loop, except I have some blue text. I hope you can make it out. Uh, that has that fake sec head um, uh, class in it. Uh, and I'm going to be reading the A section header that that class puts into the data. And that gives enough information for the Python config parser to read the config file. And note that this is one of those things that I can not only read from, but I can write to. So if, I, for example, I have a Java properties file and I have a proxy defined in that Java properties file, I can use the same kind of technique to not only read what the proxy is, if I want to you know, get that in my inventory for the computer, but I can also use it to write back and change it if the proxy changes in the future. So this is a, a very handy module to know about. I also tend to read databases to get information, usually for things like extension attributes. Um, some vendors use these things to put inf their preferences or their data in, and that often means SQLite on Mac OS. We're going to, uh, I'm going to just breeze through this one because it is complex. You're going to want to look at it uh, on your own time. But I'm going to import the SQLite 3 module, which is included. This is a lot too much to type. Uh, and I'm going to look at the McAfee agent database. You can see this if you want to get a, a trial uh, of the McAfee, uh, the McAfee endpoint suite from, from their site. If you don't happen to use it, uh, you could you could, uh, should be able to get this database yourself if you want. And I'm going to read some tables, uh, read a table and a column out of that database. And I'm going to connect to the database. I'm going to run a SQL query that I got out of Jamf Nation. Thank you very much to whoever posted it. I forgot. Uh, and I'm going to read the, the table name and the column. I'm going to fetch all that data. And then I need to get some data in a particular format for a Jamf extension attribute. So I set up that format. This is the date format for Jamf extension attributes. I'm going to get the date object that I want by referencing a couple item zeros out of there. And I'm going to convert that date format into Jamf format. And I'm going to get this date, which happens to be John McAfee's birthday. So whatever agent this is, is severely out of date. I'm going to do that one more time but I'm going to do a conversion along the way just to show you a little bit of the difference. I'm going to start with a date that might, like you might see in a property list, uh, January 24th, which is the birthday of the Macintosh. And I'm going to specify what the date format is, you know, that, that Thursday, comma, day, month, year, uh, so that I can use that for my conversion later. And I know I need to get the same result format and I'm going to import some time modules. And then I'm going to fetch the object from its original format and parse it into a Python date object. This is using the date util module, which is like the Swiss army knife of converting, thing, converting dates and times in Python. Uh, it's, it's, it's really deep, and it, I don't use it for nearly enough, but it's really handy when I need it. Then I'm going to convert it between time zones, because the information in the property list was in UTC. So I want to convert it into local time. And this is the kind of thing that you might have done with the date command, and possibly forgotten to use the dash J command, and then you really, in, really liked, uh, you, you really became a believer in NTP, because your computers that all got the wrong dates and times synced back to your server and got the right time again. Not that that's ever happened to me. Um, and but I'm going to get the local time zone from wherever I'm running this command. It's going to be in the two zone variable. And this is just kind of boilerplate text that, you know, again, I got off of Stack Overflow. I don't come up with these things all by myself. And I'm going to convert that into uh, uh, a, local, a local date and time. And that becomes the in information in date local. And then I'm going to put that into the extension attribute uh, variable using the result date format that I set up earlier, converting it along the way. And then I'm going to wrap it up and print that out because that's how a Jamf extension attribute is done. 
Next, I'm going to do XML. I'm going to find a package identifier in uh, uh, using Python. And this is, again, not something I do frequently, but it's something you could do. Um, any kind of XML, whether it's something from a package info file or a Jamf API call, which is the Python session that happened this morning uh, using APIs with Python. Uh, those are, uh, those are th this kind of thing is available. So I'm going to pull out the identifier, and in this case, the package info specified uh, an auto package package. And this is something you could try with a Jamf API command. I don't have sample data for that, so I'm going to skip by that one. But it is available in your slides if you want to look at it. Uh, and another thing I might want to do is prompt for data. So the get pass module lets me do that. If I want to prompt for the username and password, for, you know, for example, if I want to run an API script for Jamf, and I don't want the um, username and password to appear in my terminal, like if I were giving a uh, talk in front of a lot of people, uh, I can use the get pass module to provide the prompt and also not mirror the text back out. And I want to do some stuff with um, comparing data. And we're going to run out of time because we're at four minutes. Uh, but uh, this shows you how you can compare some data using uh, command line utilities. So I'm with the subprocess command. I'm pulling out uh, data from DS member util to find out if I'm a member of the admin group. The output of that is that I am a member of the group. And I'm just doing the comparison in text, double equal sign. So I'm comparing the output to this string, and then I'm saying or false. And it turns out um, I am a member of the group, so it returns true. It's kind of a nice little construct there. Um, and uh, it's error in the slide. It should be DS member util output. I'm comparing to text in a list. This is an, a list with one item in it. Uh, and, uh, and the text in the DS member util output is in that. So. Uh, some more with dates, because I, I love doing that. Um, I'm just doing some date math to add six months onto a date. And I, get, I can do that uh, and add six months onto January 24th, and I get July 24th. And versions. This is something I really love. I know uh, some people at the Philly Mac admins you know, have, uh, saw a talk that I gave all about versions. Uh, and I like using the package resources module for this, um, and it lets me do comparisons. So I can do things like 10.4.11 is greater than 10.4.1. That actually is true using this when I parse the version number. It's actually comparing it as a version number, not just a string of characters. And then I'm comparing 10.4.11 to 10.4.10, and that is also true. That's, that's greater than. And 10.4.11 is also greater than 10.4. And... Uh, 10.4.0 is the same as equal to 10.4 without the dot zero on it. So very handy stuff. In review, we've gone through all these different things, system information through making comparisons. There are some other Python sessions that are available at the conference. There's one remaining on Friday. Um, there's some others, including this one, that you might want to watch on video. So those are the links. And we have two minutes for Q&A if anybody has any other questions. And we we'll also have the links here. You mentioned software versions mm -hmm. uh, with your last one. Mm -hmm. Does it see it as mathematical mathematical expression where 10.4.10 yes. uh, or did, where 10.10 10 is same as 10.1? Sorry. Yeah, it actually is comparing them as numbers. So they appear as if they're on a number line, okay. and Python is doing an actual greater than, less than, or equal to comparison. And you can do the same kind of things with dates as well. OK, so 10.1 would be the same as 10.10. 10. No, it would not be. It would not see it that way? Right, so 10.10 10 would actually be a higher version number than 10.1 Okay. In w when you're parsing it as a version. Okay. When it's just a string, no. But when you use parse, you'll get the other thing. Awesome. All right, so we're finishing up. When you're exiting a Python talk as well as a presentation, I don't want you to exit unsuccessfully with uh, exit code one. I want you to exit with zero, which is success. So thank you for coming today. Thank you to Penn State for having us all, and see you next year.